Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Back to Basics. And we are back, and there are basics to be discussed. Hooray! Yes. Uh, despite all efforts to the contrary, I'm still Pastor Don. And with me is the fantastic Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hey, you got to come up with a new intro for yourself. Now. I know. <laughs> um, you know, I was going for kind of a Shakespearean. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. But in my case, I've only been exaggerated slightly, so I suppose it works. So, I know, I make people roll their eyes all the time. Look at it. It's a gift. It, you know, it comes with the pulpit. So, why don't we talk about what we're going to talk about today? We are going to be tackling the big end, right? This is also an audio medium, so feel free to respond. <laughs> yes, yes. We're, we're, we're starting to talk about stuff with some real substance. Yeah. This is... Yeah, we're... This is uh gonna be a big one this is god's covenant with abram uh now yep we, genesis 15 yeah genesis chapter 15 now this is one of those passages in my experience at least that is almost always discussed in sunday school but never actually read in sunday school like i have heard like going through sunday school as a kid we talked about God's covenant with Abram many times, but it was always out of like a summarized kid's Bible. We never actually talked about the thing itself. And we rarely ever read Genesis 15 or Genesis 17, where it comes back again later. Um, it was always about just kind of, there was a covenant. It happened and God promised things and yay, God. Uh, but what do you think? You think there's going to be more to it than that? Oh, always. <laughs> yeah, or else we wouldn't be talking about it. You want to just dive right in then? Yeah, sure. What, you want me to read it? I suppose I can make you read it, uh, if you're willing, that is. It's not full of, like, 80 names that I'm going to embarrassingly mispronounce and offend somebody, right? I don't know. No, it, somebody. No, it doesn't look like it. No, yeah, there's a couple. Like, you've got Eliza of Damascus, you've got the Chaldeans here, but there's nothing we haven't come into before. Uh, we're All right, so, to... spoiler warning, this is going to be a bit of a two-parter. Um, right. How far you want me to go? We are going to break, we're going to break this up into two parts because, um, like, as I've said in the past couple episodes, this is going to be a long one. Uh, chapter 15 does have a lot in it, but it does break pretty cleanly in the middle. So for this first part, we're going to do chapter 15 verses 1 through 11. And then next week, okay. we're going to look at the more trippy stuff in verses 12 on out. So, All righty. Take it away, Courtney. Okay. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give to me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer, three years old a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. All uh, right. So there is already a bit of weirdness going on here. It, it, it got pretty sacrificey, just like sharp left turn there. Yeah, but again, keep in mind that like pretty much all the way up until Jesus, animal sacrifice was a big part of the the well, it was just the Jewish religion at that point. Why do I feel like if like modern Christians got wind of some group performing animal sacrifices, they'd condemn them as satanic and like try and drive them out? Probably because they would, or at least evangelicals anyway. I mean, I, I like I like to think that mainline Christians might possibly have a more modern uh, or more open-minded look at that sort of thing but yeah evangelicals would definitely lose their friggin mind over that um 
so yeah, so there is a lot going on here. We have the, the interaction between uh, Abram and God. Uh, we have the, the promise of heirs. We have, uh, let's take out the scissors and start cutting up birds. Um, not the birds. It specifically said not the birds. <laughs> good point. Good point. So yeah, he just cut, what, what did he cut? A goat, a ram, uh, but not the turtle dove or young pigeon. So, okay. So it's it's honestly not that different from like a Yakiniku restaurant out here. Where there's just a lot of goat and ram all cut up and ready to go. Like, seems, seems pretty nice. Might be a bit overcooked in the end, but hey, we'll do what we can get. Not, I, I, I have to admit, I've never been in such an establishment. Have to imagine not a particularly spiritual experience. Says you, I love me, my meats. You did get me to eat tongue once. Yeah. That sounds that. wrong. That's not that. Yeah. No, I mean like, what was it? Beef tongue? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Cool. That was weirdly good. I yeah. was like, well, here's something I'm going to regret. Oh, wait, no, it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's one of one of my wife's favorites, actually. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's pretty good. Anyway, I digress. Um, so before I start kind of ripping stuff apart, I want to give you an option to kind of team me up here for, for any questions you've got, because I'm sure there's a few things right. that had you spock in an eyebrow or two. Um... <clears throat> Well, honestly, like the first half of this, like uh, one through six seems pretty, it, well, it seems pretty familiar for one thing. It seems a little yeah. paint by numbers because I did go to Sunday school. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, he, here, I'm going to do this thing. Are you going to do this thing? Yes, I am. And here's how you know. <laughs> now, like, I, I, I do want to draw attention to verse six, though, because we, we get that one thrown in our faces a lot, um, uh, particularly... If, you, if you've uh, uh, been listening to our hit podcast and video series, Untitled, with all of its tens of listeners, um, we have also discussed how evangelicals tend to use some of these shorter texts as kind of proof texts to say, well, you should believe me blindly and do what I say. And, I see, and I don't read it like that at all. It says, and he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is a, this is a specific instance. like Right. But I think it goes a little more than that is because this... Even in the mainline church, I've heard it suggested that what Abram's doing here is just taking the Lord at his word, unquestioningly believing in him, and God's saying, that's a good thing to do, to unquestioningly believe in what God promises. Uh, but, I'll, but if we actually look at the rest of the, the section here, there is no point at which Abram doesn't say, hey, God, what the hell? Like he's rude. Yeah, no, two verses later, he says, how am I to know that I shall possess it? I mean, you said it, but how am I supposed to take your word for it, dude? Seriously. So, like, we have, he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. But Abram is calling him out straight away before and after that moment. So the belief that's being mentioned here has got to be something very, very different uh, than the sort of blind, uh, blind faith. Now, I've preached on this passage a couple times. I think it came up in our daily devotions uh, thread at one point. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. And I think for myself, from looking at it, that when we say believe, uh, modernly, we tend to think of it as a blind thing. But historically, belief has always been what you could call an interactive experience. Um, take, for example, uh, something I know I've never talked about on this podcast uh, slash video series before, uh, Star Trek. There's the eye roll I was looking for. Um, you know, for myself, I believe that such a future is possible, but I interrogate it constantly. I ask questions about it. Like, my, I'm watching it currently with, with both my son and my daughter who are old enough to start getting into it, and they are because they are my children. Um, and at every step of the process, it's, how does that work? Why is that that way? How, how is that supposed to work? Can we do that? Do we know how to do that? Is that a thing? And... At first, I was like, wow, this is unquestionably annoying. <laughs> but then I realized that this is how we internalize things. This is how we make things a part of who we are, is by interrogating it, by questioning it, by picking them apart, looking at them, making sure that we understand them and can interface with them. And our relationship with God is not dissimilar to that. Hmm. 
So Abram's belief here is him saying, okay, God, tell me. about it." Well, and I know, I know that you and I have talked about this before. I don't know if we've brought it up on the show. <laughs> is this a show? Yeah. I think whatever. Anyway, we're 20 episodes um, in. I think it's a show. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like I hear the I remember hearing the phrase, uh, you know, have faith like a child thrown around a lot. <laughs> and it always being sort of construed as just this adoring, genuine, uh, you know, yeah, that kind of faith. Yeah. Um Which, that's a, that is faith like a child for someone who has never met or had a child. <laughs> yeah kids question everything constantly kids will question stuff they already know just because they can <laughs> like stuff that they know for a fact to be true or they know exactly what it means like <laughs> faith like a child should mean questioning everything all the time but why 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 how come yeah i had a what i think it was my it was either my youngest or my middle one we had company over one day and uh the kids are upstairs playing and all of a sudden he comes down but naked like not wearing a stitch on him and which I one I, I i forget which one was either the youngest one or the middle one and he has just got not a stitch of his name just proud as all get out and i can run up to him dude you can't come walking around people with your bits in the wind and he goes why <laughs> in the wind what is that talking about? Like, have you seen these this is awesome and i'm just like okay glad you're confident but like there's reasons for that and then i had to explain it to him again but they question everything often in the most hilarious and inappropriate ways yeah. uh, often in ways that wind up with you getting into trouble with congregants that are hanging out um but that's that's what it means that's what it means to love a thing. Like when you first fell in love with your husband, as I as I was when I first fell in love with my wife, was it just like oh, so cute, or was it like tell me all of the things about you? I mean, love is an interrogative, and so here we have a covenant presented in terms of love, and the first thing Abram does is ask questions because, of course, it is. Why wouldn't he? He's like God offering me everything tell me more why how why? when how with what how many people do i have to murder to get there spoiler alert it's a lot yeah it kind of gets uh. that wrong on intentionality of god but hey that's a discussion we'll dig into a little bit later um it is also by the way now it's worth it's going to be worth mentioning too the whole discussion about heirs as well um, because you'll notice that this is long before uh, Isaac and Ishmael and all that. Um, so there are no children of Abram. Oh, yeah. But he's already got an airline, uh, Eliezer of Damascus. A slave born in his house, it says. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting so, successional rule. Yeah. So this is, is was that like the rule or was that just like, I really like this kid? You know, there's conflicting accounts of it. Uh, one that I recently read indicated that this was probably a slave that he had picked and or bought to groom to be his successor in lieu of an heir. Um, so, like, familiar relationships in the ancient Middle East not being what they are today, it's kind of hard for us to kind of line up our more emotional familial connections with the more kind of uh, corporate, I guess you could say, structure of familial relationships in those days. But like it wasn't that big of a difference from having a, a son to an heir like he still had of course the slave was going to be you know eliza abram was eliza of abram's house like he was a slave sure he wasn't his biological son but it was going to continue the line just fine so like it wasn't as if everything abram owned and i've heard it put this way in sunday school before that like everything abram was had and owned would disperse to the winds if he had no son it wasn't the way it was set to work though so the issue of an heir isn't as big a deal as we tend to make it out but it is still a big deal for abram because like many of the jews at the time he believed in genetic lineage as well as patrilineal lineage 
So mm-hmm. he, want, he wants to have both of them lined up for the strongest possible claim. And this is the piece that's going to roll us well into the animal sacrifice bit. And I, I'll explain why in a minute. But the idea of the strongest possible legal claim here is going to be very important in how we understand this because it does not look that way to the modern eye. But what we see here, particularly in the first half of this chapter, is the ancient Middle Eastern equivalent of a signed contract. I know it, lo- it looks just like a narrative accounting of some dude cutting up some animals and saying, here, go conquer some countries. But like uh, the structure of it lines up that way? Not just the structure, the practices themselves. Um, I was reading in uh, Google here, who I always tell us to come back to, is my favorite for uh, taking apart the, uh, the early Bible, uh, about how covenants worked in those days. And covenants uh, are basically contracts. Uh, the contracts between man and God here. And the the defining attribute of this phase of the covenant process, as we've seen, is basically Abram demanding, all right, God, you say it, but I want something to hold you to. Uh, now, nowadays... Like you can hold God to anything. Hey, I, I didn't claim that humans are ever smart in their interactions with God. Like, we don't really, we don't always think it through. Like, we, we want God to, to prove and be able to hold God to it. And we're like, well, if God doesn't, what are we going to do that? We never think that hard. Uh, but this is kind of what he wanted to do. Abram was more or less trying to get God to verify uh, God's promise here in a way that made sense to Abram. So we've got this whole animal sacrifice thing. Now, today, in our culture, in our time, in our place, as has been for hundreds of years, uh, when two people want to enter into a a covenantal or contractual agreement, what do we do? We put all the details on paper. uh, We affix our name, our name, our sign, our seal, our our stamp, whatever it is, uh, to indicate our assent. And then it is to that document that we later refer if there's any conflict. And uh, as Google points out, we don't normally argue over the veracity of the signature. We argue over the contents of the document. Um, now, in the ancient Middle East, yeah, they still, I mean, they had writing for the most part at this point. Uh, there, there are stone tablets and things like that that are mentioned and what have you. But most of this sort of stuff was done by word. And since it was done orally, it was assumed that every partner would remember the deals and honor the spirit and the letter of them as best as possible. But there was still the ritual aspect of it, the the signature aspect, the the indication of assent and consent to the contract. And uh, in absence of anything to sign, of course, uh, because that wouldn't be a thing for several thousand years yet, uh, the practice of the time and the place was to engage in a ritualistic religious sacrifice as a signatory act. So when God's laying this all out, this is God saying, okay, you want your proof? I'm going to step down into your cultural context. So you guys, let's see, uh, we're talking ancient Middle East here. Okay, so we're not gonna be doing a contract. Uh, There's no Adobe e-sign or anything here. Uh, Just um, give me a couple critters from over there and a big old pair of scissors and we'll do this thing um what is with the scissors because it's funny i just like to imagine god saying we're gonna cut this ram in half Snip. I'll it's get my scissors it's like god meets tom and jerry you know if i were a divine being i'd have a little fun with it just my just my hot take on it but since i wasn't there and i have no verification in the text there's no reason to assume that god didn't act like a giant tom and jerry character when he felt like it So anyway, um, that's what's going on here with the animal sacrifices is it's a signatory act. And it's one that God is consenting to not because, and this is the bit we always miss. God is initiating this act, not because God finds it necessary to sacrifice animals, but because God recognizes the cultural context of you and in this time and place you will understand this by this act because that's how you are in your cultural context. So I'm going to initiate this process because it is your process. God comes into their space 
to interact with covenant in their way rather than mandating that they do it on God's terms. He's meeting them where they are. Exactly. Um, and so this is why I get a little weirded out when people are like, wow, you know, the Old Testament God demanded animal sacrifice and demanded all these other things. I'm like, no. No, That's people demanded them and God was like, okay, here, I'll, I'll play and, your game. Yeah, not even necessarily <laughs> demanded per se. Like what Abram is demanding here is basically a verifiable contract. Uh, the animal sacrifices we see as uh, Abram says, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I'll possess it? And then God starts listing off the animals that he wants to bring together. It seems on first glance that God is saying, well, I need an animal sacrifice to verify. Uh, but once you know the cultural context, you realize that what God's doing here is saying, okay, I know this is you. Uh, so I, like, I'm going to use language terms and concepts that you understand, and I'm going to come into that space. So it's not God demanding animal sacrifices. It's God recognizing that that's the only thing Abram's going to understand and doing it anyway. And this is going to be a continuing theme throughout Abram's story and throughout the Old Testament is, um, you know, it looking like God saying, you should do this. When most of the time God is saying, all right, we'll do this because it's a, this is you. So I'm, I'm going to line up with you so that you friggin' understand what I'm trying to say, you overgrown monkeys. Um. Well, I think we talked much earlier in Genesis too about that kind of being a, like a, a recurrent thing anyway, like, you know, explaining things in a way that we can understand explains a lot of the creation story. Yeah. Um, when you look at scientifically what we know about what actually happened right let there be light how, how do you how do you how do you explain the big bang to like some desert nomads who don't have written language yet yeah exactly. like no slagging on the desert nomads I, i'm no. sure whatever we have in like a thousand years would be completely mind frying to us but like you know yeah how, how are you supposed to explain how everything like evolution and it the cosmos and all of that exactly. you know just some folks just trying to you know make their way you know feed their families worship their god yeah like and this is this is something that we cannot lose sight of when we're interpreting the bible is that what we're reading is a record of an impossibly divine being attempting to meet humanity at different stages in their historical physical cultural evolutionary process so god appears different at different points in history but we also hold that god is the same from age to age and that can be a bit of a diff bit of a cognitive distance to hold on to until we realize that what's changing isn't god what's changing is our understanding of reality our understanding of who god is an understanding of how things work and our own ways of interacting with each other change from culture to culture. Right? They change from generation to generation. So, you know, the, the God who, who is preaching justice to the, uh, the mid 14th century peasant who's dealing with an oppressive, violent ruler might say unto that peasant, Yea, ye who art oppressed, throw thine oppressor out from yonder window in a defenestrative manner. Um, but, you know, the God speaking to a millennial in the same way might say, yo, take him and yeet. <laughs> and it'd be the same message from the same being, but God contextualizes. Just as we go back to the old Bible and look at context, God also contextualizes us. But God is operating from the same place outside of time and contextualizing differently at different points in our own history. God remains the same, but the contextualization that God has to use at different points in history is going to be entirely different. Anyway, that's thus ends the temporal physics lecture for today. I was going to say, this is getting a little, you know, we're getting off the TARDIS. What do we need to know? Yeah, sort of. yeah which honestly is a lot like going back in the Bible. It's like, all right, we're kind of time traveling here a bit. What do we need to know? And that's more or less what's happening here. But I think, I think we got enough in here. Unless you got any other questions you want to dig into for this first half? No, I, th I think we've I think we've taken this one apart and put put it back together pretty well. 
Yep. So basically, it's all context. Context is king. Uh, get back on your TARDIS, and we'll see you in the next episode type stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have, oh, until if, next time. Yeah, until next time. You, she's going to point at me. I'm going to point at her first because it's her gig. Like, share, and subscribe. That's the one. Please put this stuff out there for us because we are bad at it without people helping us to circulate these things around. In the meantime, uh, this episode is going to be coming out before this happens. So I'm going to put in a little plug here as well. On Wednesday, October the 12th, I'm going to check my phone here to make sure I got the date right. I do. Wednesday, October the 12th, at uh yeah 8 30 p.m eastern standard time uh i will be hosting well we will be on some finishes doing this as well i guess we'll be hosting a joint bible study online uh with first reformed church of new brunswick and there are going to be people from all over the place coming in and the whole theme of this bible study by the way is called detoxifying christianity so we're going to be ripping apart a whole select collection of passages uh, that have been used and abused by mostly evangelicals, but it's kind of seeped into some of us mainline folks as well over the years. So if you want to actually get in and start talking to folk about this thing, I am going to highly recommend that you check the links down below, pop over to our website where the information for that will be available as we get closer to that date, because this one's going to be held online. So no matter what time zone you're in, if you have that time available, that's eight, 30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 12th Eastern, which is 9.30 a.m. Thursday for us Japan side folks. You got that time free and you want to pop in, everybody is welcome. Like, we want to fill up that room. Now, that is being held on First Reformed Church's brand new Discord server. Uh, and I will have invite links to that on our website uh, with a nice little pop-up right on the front page of our website, probably sometime in the next few days. Uh, I'm the only one managing the website, so it may take a couple days, but the good news about that is I'm recording this half a week early before you see it, so by the time you see this episode, it'll probably already be up there. So go to the website, check it out. That pop-up box should be there. You should have an invite link. It'll all be nice, smooth, and I'm totally not setting myself a work barrier that I can't maintain. Um, check it out and join us. Like The more, the merrier. This one's going to be a fun one, and I'm really hoping that y'all can show up for that. Uh, other than that, we also have our own Discord server, which is where our community's hanging out. Uh, we got two different video slash podcast series. Uh, and I keep saying video slash podcast because if you're watching this on YouTube, this is also available as a podcast. If you're listening to this as a podcast, it's also available on YouTube, complete with all of our funny faces and weird hand gestures. Whoa! If you're on the podcast, you missed all that. So, Do you, do, do you want to see Don's crazy gesturing? Do you want to see my ever-changing assortment of fake face piercings? <laughs> <laughs> then come on down to YouTube, where the weird is. <laughs> that is probably the most app advertisement for YouTube I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. But anyway, we are going to say goodbye to you now, and we're going to say hello to you again in like two seconds as we start recording the second half of this episode. But for you, it'll be another week. So. Have a great week. We will see you on the next episode of Back to Basics, where we dig into Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 20, where it gets all kind of LSD level trippy. We'll see you then. Bye, y'all. Bye.